Good morning. This is Chewing the Gristle with my co-host, Tim Conroy. Hi, Tim. My brother, Al. How you doing? Real good. And, and we have an exciting uh, poet today. Welcome. Hey, Lara. How you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yes. I appreciate it. Lara Egger is the author of How to Love Everyone and Almost Get Away With It. It won the Juniper First Book Prize and is forthcoming from the University of Massachusetts Press, spring 2021. She is a recipient of a Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowship and a two-time Pushcart nominee. Egger's poems have appeared or will soon appear in Verse Daily, New Ohio Review, West Branch, Ninth Letter, Salt Hill, and elsewhere. Born and raised in Australia, Egger lives in Boston where she co-owns a Spanish tapas bar. She holds an MFA from Warren Wilson MFA program for writers. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here. With, with your background, you, what is your journey to poetry? And, and who were your early and present uh, mentors or poets you looked to? I guess it started, you know, my parents would always read to me when I was a kid. And so books were always a big part of my childhood, which I think is true for a lot of writers. And then in high school, uh, I wrote poetry. I wrote short fiction. Um, I think I owe a lot to my high school English teacher, Miss O'Loughlin. I still love you. Um, she introduced me to John Donne, who blew my mind. Um, and then after that, I, when I was 18, I came to Boston to do my undergraduate degree at Emerson in creative writing. Although now that I think about it, I really didn't, I didn't think that I was going to become a writer. I guess I just knew that that was something I loved and no one told me don't go to school for something you love because you'll never make any money. So I missed that part. Um, it's funny though, I do remember when I came to Boston, I didn't want to leave any of my books behind. So I ended up shipping these two giant mail bags of books with me. And I moved into the dorm and my uh, roommate's mother was there helping her move in. And I remember her saying, um, well, my daughter has a lot of shoes and you have a lot of books. And of course, my younger, less generous self was like Philistine. But um, no, I actually like shoes a lot now too. So, um, But, you know, after I graduated from Emerson, I looked for jobs in publishing, but was also working in restaurants and found that I was making more money uh, waiting tables than I would as, you know, an editorial assistant for a textbook publisher. So I kind of was continuing to write and I took some workshops at Grub Street, which is an amazing resource here in Boston. They offer workshops in all kinds of genres. And I started out actually taking workshops in short fiction and often got the feedback that my stories had sort of a lyrical quality to them. And then I ended up taking some poetry workshops there. And two of the people that um, were my teachers, Scott Challoner and Reginald Dwayne Betts, said, you should do an MFA. And it was really the first time that I'd considered doing an MFA. Um, I don't come from, I think I'm the first person in my family to go to college and I didn't come from an academic background. I didn't really know anyone who had done an MFA, but they were both like, Warren Wilson is amazing, you should go. And so from there, I really started, I guess, writing poetry more seriously and then went to Warren Wilson and 
you know, graduated four years ago, five years ago now. So that's pretty much how I got to where I am by some miracle. It wasn't planned. <laughs> and in terms of mentors or poets that I turn to, I mean, I think I began, I began loving John Donne. I went through a very strong Rilke phase, as I think we all probably do at some point in our lives. Of course, I love Rilke still. Um, now, probably the poet that I feel most um, influenced by and also envious of is Dean Young. I love Dean's work so much. Um, so he's probably the poet that I feel most sort of a, a sisterhood with. But of course, there are like a million others as well. <laughs> how can you just pick one? It's, I'm always interested in how poets describe their poetry. How would you describe your poetry? Interesting question. So um, my partner's daughter's boyfriend was visiting us from Vermont um, last week and I was working on a poem and he asked me what's it about and I was like it's about nothing. Um, I guess I would describe my my poems kind of like Seinfeld. I, I mean they're about a lot of things but I'm, I find it very hard. Narrative poetry is not my strength and I do find it hard to tell a particular story in a poem. So I would say my poems are more sort of observations about the world. I think it was interesting. We were talking before you started recording and you were talking about one of the, the aims of doing chewing the gristle is to not make uh, our conversations and poetry and other video projects seem intimidating. And I think one of the things that's important to me is, and I say it's important as if I have control over the poem when I'm writing it, which I don't, but I do think it's, I'd like to be a poet that people who don't usually read poetry might enjoy. So, yeah, that's a, a long answer to my poems are about nothing. Well, did, did your style develop at Warren Wilson or did it develop afterwards? I think it actually developed afterwards. Um, I know a lot of people who graduate from MFAs and from Warren Wilson with their thesis manuscript and that manuscript does become their first book. I would say 90% of the poems in the book that's coming out, I wrote after Warren Wilson. I still struggle with that sort of nebulous concept of voice. And I think I know I have sort of certain rhetorical crutches that I lean on that I'll use to get a poem done, but I also want to challenge myself and not necessarily be boxed box myself in to those things um so I don't know I mean you can look at a body like I look at Carl Phillips work or I look at Dean Young's work and I think you can tell a Carl Phillips poem you can tell a Dean Young poem even though you can see a change over their years of writing so I often think like is the way I'm writing now the way I'm always going to write but maybe, you know, with growth or I don't know. And that's a fascinating question, right? So what do you predict? Do you think if you project out into the future, do you think your um, how you write now is going to significantly change? Or do you think, you know, what's going to change is what you write about? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think I'm always going to be interested in, um, language as more than just meaning. Um, I tend to actually 
Barrett Warner, who you've had on the, the show before, introduced me to a poet uh, named Chris Toll, who I had never heard of, but Barrett was like, you should read him. And I loved his work. And I also loved, um, he does something where he looks for words inside other words, which really is interesting to me because I feel like we use the medium of poetry. The medium of poetry is also the medium of everyday life, right? Words, right. speech. And so I think it's interesting to look at words, not just in terms of their meanings, but uh, in terms of them being words. I'm interested in wordplay and, and that sort of thing. What, this is a great time to stop and get you to read a couple poems, I think. Yeah, sure. Um, let me start. Move this. Okay. The Igneous Hours. Today the sun whispered another secret into the deaf dog's ear. Page six of the owner's manual states, to prevent oxidization, the human shadow requires 10 minutes of eye contact daily, but mentions nothing of the soul and the heart's troubleshooting page is missing. Sometimes I try to remember where it all went wrong. Maybe the day I learned the bangles weren't singing about just another man named Monday, or the night I was mistaken for a prostitute and felt for the first time I had a shot at beauty. Did you know in Tibetan sign language, the word shadow is the same as the sign for imaginary friend? In this country just last week, a shadow was arrested for stalking. Permission, redemption, as if a sunset knows the difference. But it's true, isn't it, in those igneous hours? Anything goes. More than once you must have heard it, the world is your oyster, and the deaf dog laughing, burying the shucking knives with his bones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, should I read another one? That'd be great. If you're anything like me. If you're anything like me, you've imagined how it feels to have a magician saw you in half. Sorry, these exit seats are already taken. The irises I planted were every audacity of bruise and still you said they were ravishing. There are healthy ways to enjoy a relationship with pain. Glitter glue, for example. Sometimes I fall in love with the wrong words. Yesterday, I walked around the kitchen saying xylophone, 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 when what I really needed was a particle accelerator good with maps. Nothing changes, then it does. Who's taking minutes? I want to know why my fingerprint looks like dishwater circling a drain. I want to know why angels form a V and not a circle when they fly. If you're anything like me, you've asked yourself, is the future more like a fossil or a carnival claw vending machine? When I talk about pain, I mean these irises, frostbitten overnight. That's beautiful. How much time do you spend on revision? And when do you know your poem is finished? Well, I'll give the answer that every person will ever give you to that question, which is the poem is never finished but we only have a finite time on this earth, unfortunately. Um, I am not a, a quick drafter. I'm not someone who can sit down and bang out a first draft in half an hour. Um, if I'm not reasonably happy with the first line, I can't move on to the second. So usually my first, and I also, I, I want I personally want to be interested in my first drafts um, if I'm not interested in it, even if it's just one line that I'm interested in, um, I probably won't go back to it. But once I have a first draft that I'm reasonably happy with, um, I'm lucky enough to have a few friends who I really trust uh, that I will usually send send the poem to and get their thoughts on it. And 
I will say that for any writers who are starting out, if you can find a few people whose work you admire and who you trust, um, it's great to have a community of people that you can send your work to. So usually, you know, it'll be toiling for hours over a first draft, send it to a few people, get their thoughts on it. And it's amazing to have readers that can see, you know, as, as writers, we can only see our work through our own eyes. And I feel like it's such a gift to have someone respond and say, this is what I'm seeing in this poem. I'm like, of course, why didn't I see that? So, and it depends on the poem, of course. I mean, some poems go through, you know, 30 revisions and look nothing like the first draft when I think they're done. And other poems will go through three or four revisions and then feel like this is probably the best that I can get it now. You know, who knows what it could be 10 years from now. But, yeah. <clears throat> who or what is fueling your imagination now? Is anything fueling my imagination now? That's the question. I think, I mean, I'm always reading, I am always reading Dean Young <laughs> because actually, can I just read you one line from one of his poems that like I can't get over? And when people, yeah, when people say, let me see, I was hope I can find it because I wasn't planning on doing this, but when my, when Zach was here, the, the boyfriend, I read him this line. I was like, this is what I want to write. And he was like, what does that mean? I was like, I love you, Zach. Never mind. This is from one of Dean's, from Fall Hire. It's called Dragonfly. But just this, these two lines. The guy who hoses the slaughterhouse floor goes home and makes angels out of toothpicks. Are you kidding? <laughs> so... This definitely, um, a friend of mine, Rick Bers Bersky, he has uh, four books of poems out. He's an amazing sort of surrealist love poem. I read a lot of his work. You know, oftentimes I usually work, uh, you know, we have a two bedroom apartment. I'm in the guest room right now because it's really the only room with a door. But I usually work on the kitchen table, which is in the middle of everything. And, you know, there's magazines and I have a million books and there's bills on the table. And sometimes I'm just looking around the table and I'll see, you know, the, the Igneous Hours poem, the idea for the instruction manual. I think there was like a dishwasher instruction manual on the table. So, you know, often I draw from just really literally what's in front of me. Um, I'm a big Jeopardy fan and Jeopardy often has like amazing facts about things, which the next day I'll be like, I've got to put that in a poem. That's amazing. So I think I get my inspiration from everywhere. I do think this year has been really tough. Um, because I have trouble writing about specific things uh I guess I felt that I've I've wanted to respond to what's been happening in our country and around the world pandemic police br brutality you know just I mean the whole world is kind of on fire and I do feel that I would like to be able to respond to what's happening in my work but I also think Political poems or poems that are socially engaged do best when they're asking more questions and they're answering. And I do have a lot of questions. Um, but, yeah, the, it's, it's been a tough writing year just because I felt like if I'm not responding to all of this stuff, what, what am I doing? Okay. <clears throat> Can you share a couple more poems with us? Sure. Um, let's see. I'll read you the, the title poem of the book, which 
um, Barrett Warner published in Free State Review. How to love everyone and almost get away with it. I always thought a wolverine was some smaller version of a wolf. I was wrong about that. I was wrong to rely on envelopes as synonyms for surprise, sunrise as shorthand for peaches, wrong to expect my damage wouldn't be permanent. After an outburst of silence, we arrive at a place where the landscape is best appreciated with our eyes closed. I have been a devout acrobat, but I'm learning to look less flexible. Can you tell the difference between a guinea pig and a hamster? There are two ways to interpret that question. Sometimes I kiss my male friends on the lips. Sometimes I kiss the straight ones on the sides of their mouths and we both know what I'm doing. Someone says, don't drink all the oyster liquor. I'm so thirsty, I leave the bathroom light on all night. But when brushing my teeth, I never keep the faucet running. I'm so hungry, I devour duplicity. Being a person with, lo with loose ethics has its benefits. The lotus position, for example, a mantra of ankle boots. Taxonomy is a trick like pulling a rabbit out of a hat or sometimes a hair. Maybe I was wrong to say I loved you, even if it was true. Here are my translations, recycle them. Here is my karaoke heart. We still don't agree whether the color periwinkle swings purple or leans more blue. Nonetheless, innuendo. Nonetheless, I'd gladly spend the afternoon revising my misdemeanors with you. That's that one. That was wonderful. Thank you. So this poem is called The Mondegreen and the Mondegreen, the term Mondegreen um, is the, I guess the art or the anti-art of mishearing song lyrics. So the Mondegreen. You made us use the dictionary when we read that. <laughs> I just thought it was so cool that there was a, a word for that. Um, so to forever traipse the vast in devastation, there is no choice. The world's best ventriloquist can't lie without twitching his ears. Someone asks for a signature when we wish they wanted an autograph or sequel long, the wind chimes protesting. How painstaking my pursuit of the perfect avocado. How instantly I forgot your name the moment we were introduced. Hesitating is the orgasm, evergreen every scar. By the time I'd had enough to drink, the DJ kiboshed the wedding. Pawn shop funeral urn, mutinous skittle in a velodrome, breathless love on an inflatable bed. To be in downward dog and realize I never knew your birthday. The body's, the body's keenest memory is its sense of smell. To spill a phone number on a cat cocktail napkin. To hike solo across hindsight's tundra and to never not once play dead. Let me ask you a question uh, about selecting journals. You know, how do you go about selecting uh, journals to send your poems to? Well, I think reading a lot of journals and subscribing to as many as you can um, is a great way to figure out um, if your work might be a good fit. I also think... Um, you know, in the front or the back of every poetry book, there's an acknowledgements page. And, you know, Virginia Conchan, for example, is a poet that I love. And so you can go and see which journals, you know, if you, if you notice that you have a kinship with a particular poet who has been published, you can see, you know, which journals have published their work. Um, and I feel like that's always a good resource as well. Um, I think it's tough. I think a lot of it is, you know, even with my manuscript, I sent it out for, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe two years. And I think a lot of it is really luck because I know people who are amazing poets that are still sending their work out 
their books out. And I think oftentimes it's just finding the right reader or the right editor, you know. Um, but I do think reading as many journals as you can is what I tend to do. And also, as I said, sort of the people whose work I feel resonates with mine, seeing which journals have, have been interested in their poems. What advice would you give to the emerging poet about working through mediocrity, working hard to get better, to be persistent at it, to staying with it, but still getting rejections along the way? Um, well, I think you, well, I, I don't know if I can give any advice, but I will tell you for myself, um, I kind of think of writing poems as work a little bit. Not that it's drudgery, but that you have to show up for it. Um, so I do think even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes a day, if you can manage an hour, amazing. But even if your life only allows you 10 minutes Monday through Friday, and then you can go to town on the weekends, I think showing up and writing or revising every day is not everybody works like this, of course, but for me, I try and do that. Um, I also probably three or four, maybe five times a year, I do something called the grind, um, which is was established, I think probably 10 or more than 10 years ago now. Um, so you sign up and you commit to writing a new draft, either poetry or prose or a combination uh, every day and you send it to the group that you're assigned to. I'm actually doing the grind this month. Um, for me, doing the grind, sometimes I think that poetry lives in like the, if my brain is a house, poet, the poetry lives in the attic. And for me doing the grind, it allows me to spend the whole month in the attic, kind of sorting through all the poetry boxes. Um, and having to finish a new draft every day forces me to push through the discomfort of writing badly because it's really easy for me to start writing something, say, this is shit, I hate it, and, you know, get up and go play with the dog or something. Um, so I think just pushing through the me mediocrity or what you perceive to be your own mediocrity is helpful. Um, I think the rejections, you got to have a thick skin. I think if you're not interested or invested in your own poem, it's probably not ready to be sent out anyway. Um, so there's a little bit, I think, of just having to, if it excites you and interests you, that's the first thing that matters. Um, and I also think, yeah, have a thick skin and welcome constructive criticism. Try not to treat your poems as your babies, it's words. I don't want to sound unromantic about it, but, you know, uh, I don't, yeah, I, I would, my advice would be really, really welcome other people's opinions, but then also know that you're the poet and you have to be true to yourself. Well, let's, let's dig into your craft just a bit. And you've kind of touched on this, but what poetic elements do you tend to lean, lean on and what poetic elements do you not use or don't you stay away from? So I'm definitely metaphor heavy. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like my poems are these tightly wound, like, things and someone has to come in and like cut through like I do have a problem I think sometimes that I'm too metaphor driven um I'm also very much a, a music poet or a sound poet sometimes I know the sound of the word that I want to use before I know the meaning of the word um you know I think sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do now. I'll just ask a question. It's always good to put a little question in the poem. Uh, so those are the things that 
I tend that tend to move my poems forward, sound, metaphor. Um, I'm, I can't tell a story. I've sat down and said to myself, I really want to write about, I do really want to write a poem about the time that we were walking the dog on the Charles River and there was a dead dog floating in the river. One of the worst things I've ever seen. Do you think I can write that poem? I can't write it. I don't know why, but I just, it's very difficult for me. Um, and I do have a, a sort of a rule that I've made with myself. I never think about what I'm going to write before I sit down to write. I think for me, the process of writing, the processes of writing and thinking are so intertwined. Um, so I won't allow myself to think at all about, you know, when I'm doing the grind, when I sit down to do my poem for the day, I won't allow myself to think about it beforehand. Yeah, I mean, I guess those are the two image and, and metaphor heavy and then zero narrative. After reading your, your poetry, that makes perfect sense. I, uh, and Al, before I turn it back over to you, I just have to ask, how is writing poetry for you like running a tapas restaurant? <laughs> you know, I'm lucky because uh, having the restaurant, even though it's like a 24-7 job, it also affords me the opportunity to take some time off when I need to. And because my partner, who's my business partner and my life partner, uh, because we run it together, we can sort of share the load of, of that. Um, and, you know, having a restaurant, I do front of house and I also do some stuff in the kitchen. But, you know, you get to decorate it the way you want. I write the descriptions for the cocktail. Um, Barrett actually has a cocktail on our cocktail list. Why is it so hard to kill you? <laughs> which people love. I love it every time they order it. I'm like, if only you knew. Um, so, you know, you get to be creative in, in the restaurant world as well, which is nice. Brother Al. Oftentimes folks, when they're writing or when they're stuck, they have a resource or something they go to that helps them with their writing. Do you have any resources or books on craft that that help you when you you hit that in that 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 impasse um yeah so sometimes when i'm stuck i will open a book and pick three words randomly <laughs> and be like okay you have to put these words in the rest of the poem um because I do think that it's very easy to get stuck in one's own diction and one's own syntax. Um, and sometimes that is a sticking point for me. And yeah, definitely, I think reading craft books, there's a series, uh, I want to say Grey Wolf publishes it, but I can't be sure now, um, The Art of Books. So there's, you know, Dean Young did The Art of Recklessness. James Longenbach, The Art of the Poetic Line, Ellen Brian Voigt, The Art of Syntax. I think Carl Phillips is, is The Art of Daring. So there's a whole series and they don't, they're not just poetry, they're also prose. Mark Doty did one, maybe The Art of the Image. Um, and they're these little books and they're amazing. Uh, I also really like Stephen Dobbins's craft books. Uh, but I do think reading reading other people's because oftentimes in the in these craft books you have someone looking at a poem and dissecting it and I think it's really helpful uh to try and be able to step back from your own poem and not just look at it as what am I saying or what sounds am I employing but to see it from sort of a greater distance and to be able to dissect it in that way. And of course, you know, Google, because 
<laughs> you know. Okay, that's that, that's great. Yeah, I think we all sometimes suffer on Google. You look up one thing, which references something else, which references something else. And pretty soon your evening of writing is gone. Right. And then by the time I get back to the poem, I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work at all, actually. Now that I've read like three pages of what uh, candies have red dye number 40 in them, but never makes it into the poem. Yeah, I have that problem. Jim. Hey, would you remind our listeners uh, when your book will become available and maybe advice on how to get a hold of your book and how to follow you a little bit. Uh, and keep track on your poetry. Yeah, so the book is coming out spring of 2021. I actually don't know when that will be. Um, it's not available for pre-order yet, but I'm guessing it'll be available through Amazon. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure probably through the University of Massachusetts Press website I am on social media, but quietly. So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram, but I'm more of a, a watcher and less of a poster, I guess. And I am working on putting a, a website together, but I don't know. Sometimes websites feel like a little boastful to me. I think, you know, in Australia we have, what they call the tall poppy syndrome, where it's considered like very bad manners to sort of speak about yourself or promote yourself. And I understand that we have to do that, but I'm working on the website. Yeah, yeah and, and think about it this way. It's not about promoting yourself. It's about helping the press. There you go. There you go. There you go. Brother Al. Would you... Uh... Would you share one more poem? Sure. Um, you know, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote during this grind probably a week ago. It's the first time I've read it aloud to anyone except myself, so we'll see how it goes. How to operate under normal conditions. Things get rabbit. Things get rabbit really fast. The sky is on repeat. There are never enough blue crayons. Sometimes meaning gets in the way of understanding, as in opera, for example, or the Ten Commandments. In a parallel universe, I am God's favourite imaginary friend. In a parallel universe, I'm eight months pregnant. After it rained, we all agreed the air smelled like something familiar. Am I being familiar? My mother says all this preemptive grief is ruining my skin. That scene in the movie where the lover runs through the airport to stop the other lover from getting on the plane might be cliche, but it doesn't make that kind of certainty less enviable. Shake and bake fireworks, bathroom fandango. I'm up for anything as long as it's liaison forward. When the problem is solved, we go back to our desks and invent another one. There isn't any trick to sword swallowing. Just don't swallow. Delightful. <laughs> I want to um, encourage our, our listeners to keep watch for Lara Eggers' book when it comes out in uh, spring of 2021. Very grateful for you to, to interview with us because uh, really an interview is 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 not just us asking you questions, but in your answers, it causes us to change how we, uh, again, address you for, for more information. Again, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much. I appreciate so much that you would even think of me. But I think these conversations are so great to have, to hear other people talk about their process and their work and also to be forced to sort of articulate those things about one's own poems, I think helps, helps the process. So yay, thank you. Brother Al and Brother Tim, I love it.